Ready. Play. Novak Djokovic. Championship point. Go. Boost. Forehand return. Forehand from Novak. Backhand Medvedev. Forehand Novak. Back. And the forehand from Medvedev goes into the net. And Djokovic has won his fourth US Open title and his 24th Grand Slam overall. Fitting way to to end this. Fitting way to end this. I think. Yeah, this was this was what I guess what Bianca was talking to us about right at the beginning of the stream, where she said that she would hate it if Medvedev disrupted the final of Alcaraz Djokovic and then didn't deliver. Yeah. Well, what can you do? What can you do? There was moments. The second set was good fun. You know, maybe they've seriously, seriously had chances. But there are regrets for him, I'm sure. Things he could have done way better. And that's annoying me. This could have been a really, really good thing. Yeah, could have been. And uh, it was at times in that end of that second set shaping up to be that way. Um, and... Uh, yeah, let's. Uh, that's that, really. Um, we will have Owen come on now, as I said to you at the beginning of the stream, guys. Especially with with the time now being one thirty eight in uh, deepest darkest Poland and uh, twelve thirty eight in deepest darkest Glasgow. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I will leave. Actually, I'm not going yeah, to bed no, yet, but I, I I have something to do. Um, came up during the stream, so I will leave. Actually, so sure. thank you, guys. Thank you, Cheers, all the guys in the chat as well. Um, I don't want to say anything you know, not nice about Danny Medvedev. I will just say uh, a really disappointing final. That, that's all I'm going to say. And, and just as well, I know you're about to leave and that's fine, but just disappointing uh -huh. as, as I know it's been said two or three times throughout the night, but just took away that, that Carlos match for, for no reason yeah. in the end. Um, for you no know, reason in the end. He wins and the he's still set. due a slum. He's still due a slum. Although after today, I, I am struggling to have this words come out of my, these words come out of my mouth. Uh, anyway, see you guys. Um, All right. See you soon, Damien. Good hey, to see you. hey, Damien. <laughs> Damien's leaving on your uh, on your appearance. They're not not because of you, but uh, it's no, one thirty nine in in Poland and all that. Uh, Owen, give us your initial thoughts on on that uh, win for Novak Djokovic. Oof. Is it? too pessimistic to say that my initial thoughts are that I'm disappointed in Daniil Medvedev. Um, you, no. you, I, I, it, was, it was interesting to hear the first few words because that's kind of what we've been saying since the tie break or since the, since yeah. maybe even Novak held serve at five, six, saved a set point, right. um, more or less that period. And then we went deflated into the third set. And I think maybe Daniel yeah. did too. Yeah. I mean, so it's interesting. I think even the second set, which was like a pretty cool set, like really long, uh -huh. like exhausting Djokovic, like dead on his feet, as we've seen before. Um, I honestly wasn't even that impressed with Medvedev during that stretch. I thought the only thing he had going for him was that Djokovic was pretty tired. He um, he served his way out of a few holes, of course, as he does. He's got a great serve. But I thought that he had Djokovic hurt and like didn't really make any efforts to finish him really i didn't think he made many adjustments during the match i thought he played the same way pretty much start to finish um jack what are your thoughts because i think you're much more technically kind of mm -hmm. informed than me so like what did you see from medvedev by way of like game plan oh no it's funny so like before the match i was like oh medvedev's gonna run for plan a plan b plan c and then like <laughs> at the end of the second set i was like yeah he's really just waiting for a party the whole time and he's probably going to stick to plan A because it really does look like, and in fairness, it, I, I kind of agree, probably his best shot here was exhausting Novak 
Mm-hmm. So it's quite hard to fault him. Um, and honestly, you know, had that second set went his way, and it really could have, then this might have been a different match. But it didn't. That pressure moment came and went, and then the third set, you know, this is what happens. You know, it's very easy for Novak to then just take off with the other guy, you know, one, two percent off their game after a deflating second set. So. Yeah, and thanks, Ghosty, as well. Uh, make sure you hit the like button on on your way out. But um, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, um, he did as well have a couple of points, and I, I know it's only a couple of points, but they were so crucial. He did kind of have Novak where he wanted him. Novak was kind of in no man's land at the net, and it was probably a 50-50, maybe even a 60-40 point in favour of, of Medvedev as he's chasing down a, a short ball. And he goes to the body of Novak and Novak just gets his racket on it because actually it wasn't even hit with much venom. Whereas if he tried to go down the line on those points, there was a sense that that point was there for Novak and and bearing it, sorry, that point was there for Daniel. And bearing in mind how knife edge two, three service games were for Novak uh, at the end of that set, plus of course the tie break, you know, just one point basically would have probably been enough. I'm sorry, but the... LVP, right? Whatever you want to call it. What's the word? Least valuable player, least valuable shot on court tonight was the Daniel Medvedev passing shot. Yeah. I mean, it was non-existent. Like we saw one in that last game, and literally that was about it. the only thing that got me on my feet. Like, and, and how many of those did he hit against Alcaraz? Right? He was like, it felt yeah. like he was hitting one every return game, and then, uh, and then today it just wasn't there for him. I mean, I po- yeah. I, I paused it. I was going to say, I posited that the wide serve worked so well with Novak because he could hit the T1 pretty well. And I mean, that's that's mm-hmm. true. Dude. But there was, he, I mean, maybe never, ever he had over for it like he did against Alcaraz. He was almost disrespectful against Alcaraz and I loved it. It was good. But he should have done a bit of that against uh, Djokovic because when it got to the point where it was like 18 points out of 18-1 on serve and volley, he yeah, got to start, start taking some risks. I mean, it was it was ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, look, Medvedev w- one for three on break points. I mean, the problem I have with this is like these two played in the uh, the Australian Open final in 2021. And back then, Medvedev was sort of much less developed, didn't have a major back then. Um, and that match was about exactly as close as this one was. You had one tight set and then you had two lopsided sets. I guess this were these ones were 6-3 instead of 6-2. So it's like Medvedev didn't, like, take anything away from that. He's had, like, this was the 15th time he had played Djokovic. He knew what was coming. He knew Djokovic was going to serve in volley, and he just didn't play that well. So I'm, that's kind of my reaction. I'm pretty disappointed in him. This is very funny from Ghibli. Uh, I still think Novak should take a shot of COVID vaccine for the celebration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I'm would be funny. Page, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I see the 24 uh, shirt, uh, T-shirt, and... Um, uh, hoodies out i don't mind i know some people have issue take issue with that but you know I'm, there's dozens of t-shirts that have been made up and down over the years that we've yeah. probably never got to see um with with players but from all across the sports um winning and we never get to see them but yeah i know some people might see that but that's to be honest with you, i don't even know if novak is demanding that's probably uh marketing people to saying this and this is how it is and and if if he says fine and then, then so be it but um you know rafa has sort of numbers on his shoes as he's pursuing a, a slam etc so that's okay i i get it um regarding the match yeah it was all about that second set i mean even the first set i i, I am regurgitating some things that jack and i were saying at the time during the first set but even during the first set it was all about one game and arguably even one double fault because he only double fault i think once in the entire match and it was in a game where he got broken in was it his first or his second service game first. and yeah in his first service game so that was it done now that was the set because the rest of the set you know, he didn't, uh, uh, Medvedev didn't have any break points and, and, and Novak didn't really threaten the, the Medvedev serve match so, so much. And so it's suddenly a 6-3 thing. Uh, Jack, I, I know you said about the, the tactics uh, and I, I do hear you, but I, I still don't know what Medi can do on that return. So I guess you're going to say, yeah, come and come and play close to the baseline, right? No, no, no. I've seen cheat on it a little bit like he did against Alcaraz. So like... Oh, I see. Like take a step over and, and, and yeah. anticipate yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Even if you're guessing, sometimes the, the the fact is he was he was like never really in a position to be as on balance on that return as he was against Alcaraz, and because Novak's always going to hit the slider like within a few inches of the spot he wants to hit it right. Um, and again with the T serve, you know, hits it close enough that it feels like you can't cheat over. But take a few risks, 
take a few gambles. There was just too many times that that seven volley was just working way too well on big points. It was... Especially when you fall behind, right, Jack? Like, you can yeah. you know, start out however you're going to start out. But when you go down a set against Novak Djokovic, it's like, you got to win this next set. You absolutely have to. And so then when you don't make adjustments, it's kind of like, you. well, you deserve whatever you get. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what does this mean for sort of uh, broader perspectives in terms of, for example, for, for Medvedev going forward? Does this mean that now he, you know, bearing in mind he's not obviously won a slam for two years now. And I know you're going to shout at me and say he's only one slam, one slam anyway. So it's not like, you know, it's not like someone who's won 15 slams and then goes through a two year period. But you will also understand what I mean, that there was a period for about 15, 16 months where we just, or maybe a bit less, 14 months, where it was just like Medvedev is gone and may never come back. Well, he has come back, but are we still going to be seeing him regularly in hard court slams in the next couple of years, or or would you be owing more towards him being just a, a one slam wonder? You, either of you. Oh, do you want, yeah, I you didn't want aim to... at either of you because I, I just want to see who wanted to take up the reins first. Sure, I, I can start. I think it's a tough question because I think when when he won that semi against Alcaraz, it, for me, it was like, oh, he's back. And not only is he back, but this is the best match I've ever seen him play. And, um, you know, some people were saying, no, 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 he was better in the US Open final two years ago. And I think that the results of this match should be a nice counter argument to that, right? Like this, this match, same matchup as that 2021 US Open final. What was the difference? You got a good Djokovic. Like, you didn't have a good Djokovic two years ago. Medvedev served not. well, and he didn't have to do anything else. And against Alcaraz, he did everything as well as I've ever seen. Um, but I think the sad fact of the matter is that he's an inconsistent player. He can't um, he can't produce performances like that all that often. Um, so I think, I think he will probably win another one at some point, but I think it'll just be one more. Like, he'll make the semis or the finals, and then other times he'll lose in the third round to Sebastian Corda, like at the Australian Open. I think it's going to be a mixed bag. Yes, he did give you. That was the only two sets he dropped en route to his um, fourth US Open title and 24th Grand Slam overall. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, that was a match, I think maybe the only Novak match I didn't watch to some extent. It was just on very, very late midweek, I think. I don't know if you saw that Les Logier match that, that Novak played, um, Owen. I did, yeah. Uh, I was worried for Djokovic for like half a second at the start of the third set there. <laughs> okay, yeah, exactly. Sort of, it had, even though I didn't watch the match, the vibe that I've got since then, it had sort of Sinner uh wimbledon uh yeah. 2022 vibes to it um maybe even slightly stronger just because Leger's name in, in tennis at least is not quite as as big as uh sinners i posited funnily enough on the eve of that australian open 2021 so bearing in mind at this point no uh, daniel hadn't won a grand slam but you know it was looking more and more likely um but i posited that he would end up being a multiple grand slam winner and probably somewhere sort of four, five, six, something like that um, sort of figure. That was what I did on the eve of that slam. And, and of course, in a way, the next day changed my mind a little bit with the way uh, Novak dismantled him so easily. But still, I, I probably would have stood stood by that uh, uh, thought. And then, of course, when he finally gets over the line in, in New York uh, a few months later or nine months later, again, that was it. But then suddenly we had this five set loss to Rafa and we didn't see him. And yeah, I'm not sure, Owen. I'm not sure. Um, I would probably be more on the... If you said it, if you said, is it 50-50, I'd be more on the other side of him not winning a, a slam. I mean, there's only two of the four per year, really. Yeah. Uh, despite winning in Rome, that would just go down as an anomaly, I think, that Jack signs up for in particular. Um, that the Rome win from him was just a one-off, right, in terms of that sort of magnitude. Say that again about uh, the Rome part, John. Was so it doesn't again? really match him. It's just, it's just uh, Daniel basically is, is, is yeah, it's, it's two, two, ta two slams a year. Listen, Daniel's talking right now. Oh, and uh, J Jack, what are, um, what are your thoughts on uh, w will he get another one? Because John and I are kind of split on this. <laughs> um, I think he will. I think he's too good a hardcore player. I, I do think this is. We're obviously all very uh, de deflated and just feel like that was a terrible performance from. From Medvedev, but there, there was obviously there's obviously a lot of Novakisms in that second set to actually take it when you know he really shouldn't have been taking it, and probably against any other player, you know we probably would have seen a higher level from from Medvedev. So I, I'm sure that you know the, the Carlos win wasn't a fluke. Um, keep that in mind. Novak's probably the only player that is really 
you know, really deserve to beat Medvedev this tournament, that can go on forever. I think he will win another slam. Okay, so it's two against one. We'll see how this pans out. I'll uh, I'll remind you of this when we're in uh, we're on our rocking chairs in in uh, 30, 40, 50. Well, probably in my case, maybe 30 or 40 years. In Owen's yeah, case... Jack and I have some time, John. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. I'm not far away from it, I think, at certain times, especially the amount of late nights I've had in the last uh, 10 days or so in particular. Damien and I have been burning the midnight oil, uh, talking about all sorts of things. I remember once we were talking about ABBA songs, uh, for example, at, at one point. I don't remember which match that was, but... Uh, that was certainly a, a quirky one. Uh, yeah, no, I just would lean more uh, against him not doing it because I actually see this this run he's had as being a bit um, special. I mean, he did come through Dimonor and Carlos, arguably his two biggest nemesis, if that is even the plural of nemesis. I have no nemesis, clue. Nemesis, nemesis, yeah, nemesis. Nemesis, nemesis. Um, anyway, uh, you get what I mean then. And I, I also think that, that, that other players on the tour will be back and will be back stronger as we uh, Runo and, and I think Carlos is obviously going nowhere and, and Novak is going nowhere. Let's let's bring it to Novak really, Owen, because I did go into this final thinking actually we should see a pretty good Novak because I didn't quite feel as though the pressure of chasing a calendar slam like it was in 21 or chasing 23 as it was in, in, in Paris or uh, maybe he was anxious against City Pass, but it didn't really matter against Stefanos in, in Melbourne. Yeah, that um, match was worse than this one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe, maybe. Maybe it felt more inevitable as well because the history between Stefanos and, mm. and um and Novak is far worse. But what I went into this thinking we're gonna Novak might not win it, but it won't be because of anxiety. Yeah, I, I felt the same way. I like the thing I did worry about for him was that um he hadn't been tested. I mean, yeah, he was tested against Jared, but then that semi against Shelton, like not only was that match not close, but Shelton plays nothing like Medvedev. Um and Medvedev, I thought, having come through someone like Alcaraz, he was going to be battle-tested. He was going to be ready to go. And it kind of worked out the opposite way. Djokovic came out sharp. Um, he, um, I think, like, the second or third game, he just, like, nailed the forehand down the line right onto the sideline. Um, and then he had Medvedev double fall, saying, like, it was a it was a perfect start. And it was... Um, I, I, I thought it was almost like Djokovic was playing an Australian Open final instead of a U.S. Open final from the way he played for a lot of the match. Um I thought he would struggle a lot more than he did. Yeah. Uh, physically, there was obviously a couple of things going on for me. Uh, one was the, the clearly obvious one, which was was uh, Novak's troubles towards the end of the second set. We remember him keeling over after a couple of points and maybe even just falling off balance. Uh, I did feel, though, once it even got, even as even when it went into the tiebreak, we didn't see any major issues during that tiebreak. Admittedly, we didn't see 20, 30 shot rallies, but I didn't notice any, I, I think, once he'd got through those two really tough service games, both in terms of mileage, but also in terms of tension, actually going into the tiebreak, he was almost back to, to normal, if you like. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually think that maybe during the tiebreak, but particularly during the third set, it may even have been Medvedev who was just struggling a bit physically. I remember him falling over after one point and, and uh, Novak coming over the other side of the net to see if he needed a lift up. And OK, that may not have been down to fatigue, but I saw some tired looking shots from Daniel. And so in the third set, I don't know. Maybe it was 50-50, but there was certainly no Daniel needs. Uh, the, the thought that Jack was repeating and, and completely understandably, you know, this could this could be a war of attrition. And that's that's the uh, area that Daniel needs to go. That wasn't the case for me in the third set that actually Novak was fine again, pretty much. Yeah, definitely. I'd, I'd agree with most of that. But I would say in the second set, Tyreek, it's quite easy to forget that Medvedev actually played well for quite a lot of it. I mean, he played an insanely good point, really physical point at four all to get up five mm -hmm. four. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then we got to five all, and it was a flipping serving volley again, super easy to win the point. And then it was six five, and it was just a netted backhand, right? And th those kind of moments uh, make all the difference. And it was just a, it was a surefire tactic. If you wanted to say one thing that separated the two, that was just a surefire way for Djokovic to win a point. And he used it so often. It was so frustrating to watch. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, so uh, about the fatigue thing, I had a question for you too, because I'm not convinced that that was ever like, that winning a war of attrition was ever like a viable game plan for Medvedev. Because if you look at what happened, Djokovic, you see the first signs of fatigue in like the fifth game, like 3-1 in the first set. They had like this murderous rally and already Djokovic is hunched over, right? And do you guys remember... Um, 
at the ACP finals last year. We do, he, we he, do. He, it he came up in conversation. Up. And then the final against Rude, again, he's like, he's literally shaking on the changeover in like the fourth game of the match. But he always wins those matches. Like, <laughs> look, look, like you were saying, John, he like, he's like collapsing in the second set. And then in the third set, he looks stronger. Like, we know how this goes with him. It's like, it's all in how he looks. He, um, he looks vulnerable. He looks exhausted. And then he pulls out a tight set and he's like fresh again. Like players, you can't bank on like, he's never actually fully collapsed physically. It's not going to happen. You can't force him there. So like, yeah, make him run because like maybe he's going to give up on points a little easier. But like, there's got to be more to your game plan than like let's grind him down because like you can do it a little bit. He'll like give you hope. He'll like collapse a few times, but it's just not. It's just not ever going to fully work out. Like, do you two agree with that? Like, what were you saying? So the reason the reason I kind of countered that basically is if you try to do that in a different city, particularly in Melbourne. It might not be as effective where the the air is a little drier, but we yeah. have seen Novak actually get affected by that. Not like collapsing like he did today, which was pretty dramatic. But um, we have <laughs> we have seen him getting to the point where he does like struggle to to keep up in the rallies because he's, he's breathing a little bit heavier, mm-hmm. and it, it has had an effect. It genuinely has had an effect in the match that he's played, and that's why he's got quite a spotty record here. You know, there's been matches where. He yeah. has been outplayed physically, so I, I did think it was a it was a possibility. I didn't think it was out of the question. Okay, that that's fair. I mean, I think um, I, I wouldn't blame physicality in like all of those finals, but I do think like twenty twelve against yeah. Murray that like like that one he did get like outlasted. But I I just think it's such a tricky thing to bank on. Like even when it does have like an effect you can feel, it feels like it's like a one or two percent difference, uh, and it's never really much more than that. Yeah. yeah, I'm not saying it's something that he could. Uh, so I'm probably I was leaning towards Jack during those moments during that second set, and I would still lean that way. But I would actually sort of isolate it in that set. I wouldn't necessarily think it's something to lean on for the rest of the match. But let's get this set done in, in this manner because this is kind of working right now. And between the sort of game, service game four, five, and six, something like that, in that, um, don't forget, you didn't even have a great point on Novak's serve. Until four three, I think it was. Um, so the yeah, three, like serving first. I'm not. Yeah, no, Daniel was serving first. So yeah, till four three. So three four was the first time he had a break point, and we did see him turn the screw a bit. But I also liked it that he was moving Novak from side to side because okay, you've still got a lot of effort with with having dealing with shots down the middle. You've still got the mental side of it to just keep focus, especially if the shots are deep. But you still at times maybe from during the tie break, but also at the beginning of the third set. He just wasn't moving. Uh, no, wasn't moving Novak around enough, and so therefore, I still think he could have done a bit more there, but still play with margin, as I said uh, during the live stream. But I think during that period, I think it was working, and I think you know that was that was the right tactic. Now it may well have been that he wins that, but it, it, you need to win that second set. You win then with the second set, and now we've got four sets to be playing with, right. and then we'll see how it pans out for the first two or three games. At the beginning of the third set, Novak would have still taken his toilet break, and therefore I think he would have been rejuvenated. And it, but we could just reset at that point, and maybe we'll come back to that tactic towards the end of the third set, or maybe near the end of the fourth set if it's working again. Then, but we'll we'll lean on that maybe in in moments during the match. That's what I would would lean to right now as a, as somebody who's talking after the event, if you like, and after the match. Mm. But um, yeah, that's that's my my two cents on that. Yeah, I, that, that's totally fair. And like, I, I guess it was having some success. You had the break point at 4-3 in the second set. And um, I since I've kind of dumped on Medvedev for a while, I do want to credit Djokovic. Like, absolutely amazing touch at net. Like, that that half volley to save that. Oh, break. yeah, yeah. I mean, he could not have hit that shot until, like, recent years. Like, if, if you put his 2008 or even his 2011 self up there, that, that volley is going, like, flying into the stands or the bottom of the net. That was, it was perfect. Um, and... Uh, you know, he, he did have that reliable serve and volley tactic, but part of the reason why it was so reliable is because he volleyed so well. Um, so he's um, just become such a complete player. His transition game wasn't all that great for a long time. So, um, yeah, that was just exceptional work there. Mm-hmm. I get where you're coming from with this, Ghibli. Um, I, of course, I don't think he will, and I don't think he should either with so many. There's still one or two goals to to see to see off Alcaraz, you know. I mean, I don't mean he's going to see him off because he's not going to outlast him. But if he just wins this this battle over this next 18 months and then retires, let's say with a win, win, loss, positive, a head-to-head positive record, and he picks up an Olympics, for example, on route, then I, I I know he's got almost nothing less to achieve. And I'm not saying that means that he that that will make him the go or that will mean him. I'm not talking in those contexts, but I still think he will feel like that. 
but I see where Ghibli's coming from as well because you know there may be some people out there thinking maybe Rafa should have just called it a day after the French Open win of 2022 now you net you just don't know how the next four weeks are going to pan out bearing in mind the Taylor Fritz and then the subsequent retirement and then obviously the loss to to Tiafo at the US Open you just, you, there's no way you would have done that but hindsight and all that maybe yeah would have because it, it's there was a chess player i think he beat gary kasparov once and he just said that's it i'm done and he quit and gary kasparov just that drove him nuts it just drove him nuts i can't remember who the <laughs> opponent was but yeah right and it would i mean listen if no if raf had retired on 22 with with novak on 20 just said that's it i'm done you know novak could get to 30 and it would still be like yep yeah, yeah, that's fine but you know right but I, I retired on top yeah yeah right and uh and it's it's not necessarily you know quitting either. It's not like you're you're ducking out the fight or you, you've just you've just got to retire because injuries have caught up with you. You've also got a two slam margin. You've also got that Australian Open thing done as well in terms of the double slam. And yeah, and it would have been a it would I forget who the chess player was, but he beat Kasparov and Kasparov was just spitting feathers and probably still is to this day um, uh, in his New York apartment somewhere. Uh, Jack, um, we do want to wrap this up as I see. Uh, um, uh, Novak Djokovic uh, lifting his fourth U.S. Open title. Of course, now he's got he's gone round three times with the with the slams, and you know potentially he could be looking a fourth one. I, I actually don't put as much stock in that as as some people might. As in, like I think I think getting the one was really important for Roger, and I actually do think getting the two for Rafa was was quite significant. Mm -hmm. Two, three, four, <laughs> five. <laughs> yeah i mean it's yeah quite, but I mean, quite a big deal isn't it? <laughs> of course it's huge but i i just don't look at that really that much it's it's multiple and and that's you know if somebody had um five five of each let's say they had five of each and they had 20 slams for example mm -hmm. i would probably still value 22 or 23 or 24 more even if it was seven australians and two us or whatever that dynamic happened to be Anyway, that's that's me going off at a tangent there. Just give me some uh, final maybe words either on Novak or Daniel or both, um, Jack, and, and maybe what this means and where Novak's short-term future is and what's he going to be up to, winning yeah. ATP Tour finals and all that. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you my unfiltered thoughts and maybe I'll revise them as I have a little bit more time to think about it. But, okay, yeah, amazing achievement for Novak to get to 24. Incredible to um, get another US Open title. It's a little bit of a deflating narrative, right? I, I, I do feel like I really wanted to see Medvedev finally, you know, do something a bit different here. I, I was hyping up so much at the start of the, the match. Going forward now, Novak's won three again in a year. Next year, if Novak keeps winning, this is going to get old. I'm sorry, but it is. I, I, Novak is doing amazing things, but... All of a sudden, he's just broken one too many records for me. Like, <laughs> and I would like to see Alcaraz really properly contest. Otherwise, yeah, it, it's a, the problem I mean, is though, that's Jack. The, the problem is Jack that that um, and 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 I'll, maybe Owen can add something to this as well. But if we put too much, and we are, and understandably so, we are putting a lot of stock in this Djokovic Alcaraz situation. And because we also know that if that doesn't, if that final doesn't happen at these big tournaments, we're going to potentially get finals like we had today or like we had in Australia. Of course, uh, Alcaraz wasn't there in Australia or we might get a final like we had at the French Open. So basically, we look at the draw. And of course, at least now they're on separate halves. But, you, you, you know, that that's it. We put a bit like with the big three. We were just waiting. Uh, the 2019 Wimbledon for me crystallized it. Uh, it shouldn't do because they were both well into their 30s at the time. But that Wimbledon 2019 was really only interesting in many respects for like three matches at the end or two yeah. matches even. Um, the and it was just all lost in like the first round of that tournament. I exactly. Remember. <laughs> exactly. Nick Kyrgios maybe made things a bit interesting. I think he took a set off Rafa. But the, yeah. the rest of it was just basically basically just waiting for no uh, jo uh, Djokovic. Sorry, basically just waiting for Federer and, and Nadal to play in the semi-final because even Bautista, yeah. a good bless him, was probably not. And I think he took a set off Novak, but th that match was probably never in doubt. Um, and I'm just worried that we're going to be putting too much stock in, in this as well because... You know, we, we can't rely on it all the time and, and things therefore, you know, so even even what I'm saying is this. Sorry, it's coming to your point, Jack. Even if um, Carlos does make it incredible and we have six unbelievable matches between those two next year. Early rounds at slams aside. 
you know, we might get a sinner out my exactly. I remember that match for, with great fondness from 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 the French Open this year. But other than that, that and maybe even uh, Stricker against it to pass this year. In New York, that's it. That's it. We, we're just going to keep waiting. These and this slam, we were waiting for it, weren't we? We we knew they were on opposite halves of the draw. We saw that Carlos's draw was maybe a little bit trickier. You know, probably the many neutral observers will think, let's put Medvedev on that side and let's have a Medvedev Djokovic semi final because I think that could be interesting. It may well have panned out like this, but we'll never know. Let's have Alcaraz with somebody else, but and then we'll get that final maybe with them both at Batlan. But we're just sort of almost waiting for the match to happen. And it does make up for it when it does happen. Of course it does. Yeah. It, well, it, yeah. There'll be probably 50% of the tournaments when it doesn't, you know, maybe more. I think there's an argument to be made all of a sudden. Maybe not all of a sudden. I think this has been creeping up on us for a while. But I think I would argue the men's game's losing a little bit of depth. Yeah. Just a touch. Yeah. I, 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 I would say it's losing a lot of depth. <laughs> you, just did, you just said in three or four words what I did in about five minutes. Well, I do apologize. <laughs> I, I, I think both have great points. I mean, so look, like, Djokovic Alcaraz is like the best show in tennis, right? But if... Look, I, I think what we need to do is kind of put the pressure on everyone else a little bit. Because, like, Alcaraz, he did what we wanted, right? He beat Djokovic in the Wimbledon final. He's going to lose in the semis of the U.S. Open. Sometimes that's fine. He, like, he's 20 and he's won two majors. Where the hell is everyone else? Like, Sinner, yeah, Runa, Felix Oje, Ali Rasim, Tsitsipas. Like, you all have been around for years. Like, get to it, you know? Djokovic is 36. Yeah. The blueprint for how to beat him is now out there. Like... So, you know, get yourselves to where you need to be, because right now we have a big two. I guess Medvedev made it a big three after that semifinal, but then Djokovic beat him too. So, like, you know, I think it's time to sort of decide, like, are you going to dare to be great, or are you going to settle for mediocrity by the standards of the top ten? Like, I think it's on everyone else to kind of catch up to the leaders of mm -hmm. the pack at this point. Yeah. Absolutely. Al honestly, Alcaraz doing a good job is almost good enough for me. Yeah, like, it's, yeah. I think six amazing matches between Alcaraz and Djokovic next year, that would absolutely make up for quite a lot of the yeah. shortcomings. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm looking forward to it if it happens, um, but it's no guarantee. And yeah, we do need a few more challenges. For yeah, sure. De depth is the key. And, and depth at the top, you know, it's it's all well and good having, you know, that the that City Pass can lose to Stricker. That's depth in a way, and that is, that's true. Um, but we also need City Pass to be able to beat Novak or Carlos as well, and 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 let's add Carlos yeah. to that because City Pass's record against him is getting quite demoralising. And I think City Pass himself, and I know this is a bit of a tangent, but when I asked him this year and I compared his 2021 Barcelona run and also 2022 when he was close, he was close to Novak that year. Sorry, he's close to Carlos that year, and he lost in three sets. I asked him early on this year. I said, you know, I was trying to sort of compare. You know, does that feel worse to lose to Rafa when you had a, a championship point in Barcelona? And also, does it feel worse because you were really close to Carlos last year? Or well, this year, you're way off. Now, of course, I framed it in a bit of a calmer and nice way. That's a great question, John. Yeah, right. But you know what? And I think this told me the answer. He went off at a very strange tangent, as I know Stefanos oh, can. Uh, as I know Stefanos can. But, um, but he also went off saying, well, in football, you know, you, you've got 11 players against 11 and some yeah. weeks you win. It was so it was so it, it was so off that made me think, I think he just doesn't know what the answer is, not just to my question, but more importantly, the Carlos question. And I think that's in a way bigger picture is actually far worse for these guys. So not just Stefanos, but all of them, you know, that are not getting close to these two that in the moment it's it's horrible. But actually bigger picture at the end of your career, you go. Actually, that's why I ended up winning a slam a year later or winning a 1,000 or whatever, because I was really close and it, I, I knew that it was just a point or two here and there. But unfortunately for Stefanos and like like many of them, they're actually further away than the, from the big players and the big two as it is right now than, than ever yeah. before. I'm sorry, you might have some, one more thing to say on that one, um, Owen. Yeah, can, can I float a hot take uh, by you guys? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. sure. If, yeah. if Jack's still awake, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Go for it. Okay, so, so what if... What if Titi Pass is Doug? I think the air is out of him. Like he, mm -hmm. you watch what he's doing now, and you watch him in 2021. And 2021 was a tough year, but he, championship point against Nadal in Barcelona, close to beating Djokovic in Rome, two sets up against Djokovic in, in Roland Garros. He was hungry. Yeah. Since then, ne hasn't hasn't beaten Djokovic. Has lost endlessly to Alcaraz. And so I think like when you watch him against like Andy Murray, it's like same player. But when you watch him against the top players, I think like his soul is gone. Like, I think 
And I don't know if that's necessarily going to change. Maybe like when, when Joe's been soul, for two years. Sorry? His soul was his soul was gone that day in Barcelona, and we saw the repeat in Paris a few weeks later. Yeah, he he got demolished, right? He's I think the hunger and the belief are kind of gone, and I think like, you know, I might have even said the same thing about Medvedev before he beat Alcaraz in the semis, but I think it's like the years of losses are not helping these guys psychologically. You know, like we saw what yeah. Djokovic did. He lost endlessly to Federer and Nadal, and it made him better. These guys are not like that. They're they're losing, and they're not getting better. So that's a problem, right? Do we need yeah. new players? Do we need, like, is, is Runa going to be different? Is Sinner different? Because he's still kind of, it feels like he's younger than he is. Um, yeah. I've got 10 seconds on this, Jack, and then I'll immediately give it over to you. When you said to me about that half volley and, and from Novak and the difference between him now compared to 15 years ago, it was just, you know, many of us have said this line many times over, but it's like, this is the big three. This is the big two as it is now as well. They're getting better. They're, they're thinking, okay, you know, Carlos talks about concentration and many other things as well, but whatever. They're all looking at ways of improving and they're, they're, all, they're already the best, but they still want to improve. I don't see that from from the rest in a way. And and um, anyway, go on, Jack. Um, I th I'm, I'm I am optimistic about the the new gen. I do think Runa genuinely, the, Runa and Sinner are genuinely still very young, and they yeah. do have they do have a lot of potential. Both of them, hundred percent, have loads of potential. I know that. I'm not saying that lightly. I'm not just saying that for saying that sake. I just mean like their base game and what they can do with the ball. And the improvements they still have to make is very promising. Whereas the other guys have been at the same level for so, so, so long, it's very tough to be optimistic about them. That's basically it. So I I, I am still keen to see where Sinner and Runa can get to. Um, everybody else, I'm feeling very down. Particularly made for Dev right now, but I, I might get back in that too. But yeah, I think, I mean, you were a little bit more on, on the City Pass generation, City Pass in particular than yeah. Holger. I mean, Rune has got yeah. some time and all the rest of it, right? Right. M Medvedev, I can forgive a little just because he won his Me major, too. you know? Like, um, yeah. I mean, even guys like Felix, like, he's what's ha he's gotten worse. Like, it's not, mm -hmm. he was doing good things in, like, late 2022 when he was up two sets on Medvedev. Like, he took Nadal to five at Roland Garros. Where the hell is he? What happened? Like, it's... <laughs> And I, I, and I don't mean to pick on him, and I don't mean to pick on Steph, but it feels like this is a problem for, like, the entire next gen, essentially. I mean, look, like, with Zverev, I'm glad, because he's, like, a terrible guy, and it means we don't have to talk to him. But, like, him, too. He's been around for ages. He didn't get any better. Um, and so I think that, like, when that happens with an entire set of players who are in the top 10, top 20, like, yeah, it's just the gap between those special players and everyone else is now like gigantic. Uh, and I think that's not necessarily great for the pre final portion of tournaments. People sometimes ask me about, like, just in the chat, of course, and, and I absolutely have no idea what the answer is. But people talk about Stefanos and this, of course, this relationship he has. And I'm not, I really aren't interested, but I do, so, I do mention this, and this will be something for you two to, to be aware of because I'm guessing you don't know this story. Chris Everett in a final against Martina Navratilova at Wimbledon sometime mid to late 70s, she said, I didn't care about losing. I just cared about John Lloyd, her, her boyfriend at the time. Uh, <laughs> and I just thought that's kind of interesting. And I, I have no idea, positive or negative, how these relationships work. I know that Sir Alex Ferguson, a uh, Glaswegian, much like a um, friend of the Paris Jack is, uh, said that he wanted all his players to be married because he kind of wanted to know where they were at two in the morning, if you like. But yeah. um, but there's a different dynamic with managing 20, 30 youngsters, if you like, compared to being a, a tennis player and the professionalism that uh, guys can be up to there. Um, but I just thought that Chris, the other thing was interesting because I, I know what that I get it. I get it. You're just you're kind of just on cloud nine. You don't mind if you win or lose and you end up losing the final and, and it doesn't matter if you like. And um, I don't know. I mean, there's a, the, the, the final thing is with with Stefanos, by the way, and I know we're not here to talk about since past when Djokovic just won his 24th grand slam. Chaos. It's chaos. Employing a coach uh, to be alongside your, your your father and the rest of the team and then saying uh, three's a crowd, including himself in that dynamic and saying, sorry, uh, OK, fine. That's your decision. And that makes sense. How can it then not? And then if he goes off and t is with Maria Sacri for a few weeks. This is um, uh, uh, this is Mark Philippus. I'm not talking about Stefano Tsitsipas for people wondering what's going on there. And Paolo Badosa is coming on the show in a minute to shout, what's all this Maria Sacri business all about? No, Philippus <laughs> uh, was coaching her for a few weeks. And it's like, OK, well, I guess that's done. And then uh, Stefano says, um, actually, I 
got rid of the wrong guy, which I think probably many of us just on the outside were speculating when he when he cut off Philippoussis. He said it was chaotic and that's not what he needed. He loves his family and his family will still be there. And in a way, we've got other family members, you know, Rafa's father's always nearby, his uncle's always in the, you know, in the shadows somewhere. These guys that when Rafa's talking about his team, you and often we do think about family members as being part of that team as well. And so we just understood that's where his father will be. And we didn't really see him at all uh, over the last sort of six weeks or so. And that sort of decision made sense. So why does it now make sense to say, sorry, Mark, this is not right. I, I, I don't, yeah. they can't, all those decisions, I would suggest they could all be wrong, but they certainly can't all be right. Right. So, so quickly, did, did you guys see TT Foss didn't ask me anything on Reddit and someone said, are you going to separate with your dad ever? And TT Foss says like, no, he's helped my career enorm- enormously. He will always be by my side. So there you go. He like, it's not going to happen. Um, you know, like, I think that's all right. It. Listen, we've done our Stefanos City Pass uh, chat tick. That's done. And I've done it with Jack before. He's seen, he's seen me talk about this before. So that's fine. Uh, His guys, eviscerate me on Twitter again. <laughs> oh, oh, they do. There's a, there's a, there's certain, there's fan bases of players that I like that, that, that come for people like the eager fans, Stefanos fans, Novak fans, even Rafa fans. Uh, I've been, uh, yeah, I've been accused of all sorts from, from each fan base and they are, um, Equally odd because they all build a, a narrative and it and it fits their their needs. If you like what what but but befuddles me and, and so this is bringing it back to Djokovic, but but also Nadal. I don't know why they get they get so angry. I I see Djokovic fans getting angry with Ben Shelton the other day, and I'm thinking, hang on a second, okay, whether you agree or disagree with the Djokovic celebration, that's fine. I get that. Why are you angry with Ben Shelton? Your guy's just won. He's in his 36th Grand Slam final. He's about to win his 24th Grand Slam. <laughs> I, when 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 my football team or my favorite player or whatever is winning, I don't care. I'm not getting involved in all that, and I don't know. It doesn't uh, make any sense. And the narrative is though Novak had to mock Shelton's celebration because Shelton did something wrong to Novak, so there had to be something to pick out that yeah. you know is. It's it's crazy. Like um, you know when uh Djokovic fans tweet like the whole thing about like uh. Djokovic is like hasn't lost a set against Nadal on hard court since 2013. It's like, look, if the point you're making is that Djokovic is a better player than Nadal, I agree with you, obviously. But like, yeah. they feel the need to argue that like Nadal is not like also great. I'm like, yeah. why? Like, why would you do that? Like, your guy is the best <laughs> ever. Like, enjoy that. Why? Why are you so trying to tear down like the smaller mountains? Like, I don't. Yeah. I don't get it. I, I, it. It annoyed me for one second. Uh, when when people would talk about um, uh, you know Novak not being at the 2022 Australian Open, but I swear one second, one it'd be like, oh, no, but okay, yeah. The rest of the time, you know, was just fine. You know, you you know my allegiances, both of you, and and pretty much, I'm sure everyone does in the audience. Uh, you know, it was completely fine. I uh, you know Novak, just like um, you know when I'm I don't I'm sure 90. Five percent of sane Novak fans, when Rafa fans mention his foot or his injury at the 2021 Australian Open, if I was a Novak fan, that would not bother me one single bit, because Novak won arguably the greatest set of tennis I've ever seen in my life. Uh, he won a mammoth tournament where he came comes from two sets down on two separate occasions. He's beaten Rafa Nadal on his home turf, if you like, um, you know, in his backyard. Blah blah blah. It should be a moment of celebration and not getting involved with just silly people. I mean, I I, I want to say to some of these people who are super smart and super logical in every single element of their life, and I say, what would you do with a flat earther? Do you get involved with the, the debates with the flat <laughs> earthers and stuff? And they're like, well, no, of course, it's just dumb. And I'm like, right, apply that to this, this <laughs> bloody situation because you really should. <laughs> On flat earthers... <laughs> uh, we'll be back with our show, Flat Earthers, next week. Uh, Flat Earthers Rejoice. Uh, join us for that as I get uh, 24 people to mention each one of uh, uh, Novak Djokovic's Grand Slams to all convince us, though, that the Earth is indeed flat. Uh, on that bombshell, uh, I want to say a big thanks to Jack, who's obviously been here for five hours, or I don't know what it is, yeah, five and a half hours or whatever it is. And also, Owen, as well, for your stint at the end there. It was much appreciated, and it's been great catching up with you a couple of times during the US Open. So uh, a big thanks to you guys. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Much love, John. See you later on. Thank you. All right. That's <laughs> fine. And everybody, you know the drill. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell so you don't miss out on all things.
things tennis.